receive the word this morning. Just pray after me and say, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit I, trust you I trust you to make the word of God come alive in me. Let me receive it with joy. And let it bear fruit in my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. That's it. Today's message is called The Secret to Your Success. And uh, I just thought of something. If I tell you, it won't be a secret anymore. So you yeah, better forget the whole thing. What do you think? No. No? Okay. But I'm continuing with a series of new beginnings. And, and everything that happens as a Christian is new. It's like your life has just literally started over and things start to change. And, you know, some of us have been saved for a long, long time. Some have been saved for a shorter period. But I think you notice it more up front, the things that, that God is doing. Yes. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> so I have this, this series is, is kind of twofold. I want everyone to see how, you know, being a Christian changes everything. That we get a, a fresh start. And I also want people to be excited about the journey ahead. Turn and tell somebody, you need to be excited about Jesus. Amen. He is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. And you know, I can think of some wild and crazy things, and God can do even more. That's an awesome, awesome thing. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Boy, you should have it memorized by the end of this series. And this is in the New Living Translation. I wanted you to, to think about it in a more modern English version. It says, this means that anyone, turn and tell your neighbor, anyone means anyone, who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. Guess what? A new life has begun. And I don't know about you, but we need to be excited about what God can do. Amen. And you know, if you grab a hold of what I'm going to share this morning, it will change your life. Because I'm going to break something down into steps. I'm going to give you the steps to be successful all the time. Not just some of the time, not just most of the time. All the time. Wouldn't that be cool? Amen. Be successful in everything you do? Well, Paul said in Philippians 3.12, he said, Not that I've already attained... Paul, who wrote over half the New Testament, who brought the gospel to the, the non-Jewish world, the Gentiles. He said, not that I've already attained or I've already perfected, but I press on that I would lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. One thing we all need to do, we got to quit looking behind. Yeah. Start looking ahead. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Did you ever do something and say, oh, man, if I only hadn't done that. Working on something. I usually am working on something following instructions, and I get to the point where it says, remember, don't do this. And I look and say, I just did that. I just dropped that screw down inside. Now what am I going to do? But you know what? With Christ, we don't ever have to look over our shoulder because every single day is a new day in Jesus. Amen? Give the Lord a new praise. It's new. Yep. Yeah. Wouldn't it, if you're, you know, you're home with the sniffles and a cold, Maybe tomorrow you won't have a cold. Isn't that a good thing? You don't say, oh, I wish I could have that cold back. No. <laughs> yeah. Turn and tell your neighbor, quit looking over your shoulder. Oh. Yeah. So let me ask you something. Where is your real focus in life? Is it on the past or is it on the future? Are you looking forward, anticipating the victories that lie ahead, or are you too busy looking over your shoulder at all the defeats of the past? that you can't spot the opportunities that are right in front of you. You know, some people are so busy with the past that they can't see the future. 
They can't enjoy it today because they're worried about what happened yesterday. Or last month, or last year, or maybe 20 years ago. Yeah? yeah. I did a sermon a, a long time ago. I used to be on the radio, and I would tape record on cassette tapes the messages. We literally had to drive them down to the radio station in Syracuse to have them put on. This was a few years ago. Technology's changed now. Okay? And I went to take one down there, and it was a trem tremendous message. It was called Ghost Ships of the Past. Kind of dealt with, with things in the past. The things in the past, they're past, they're not real anymore. They're gone, they're over with. Amen? Amen. And so I would edit the tape a little bit before I took it down there. Sometimes if it was too long or whatever, because we only had, I think, a half an hour's air time. And I would kind of tighten it up, so I put it on. Those ships of the past, and I pressed the button and I heard <laughs> 30 minutes of dead air. <laughs> there was nothing there. And I said, Lord, are you trying to make a point? Those ships of the past is gone. But you know what? Your past is dead air. It isn't there anymore. It's gone. Amen. Especially your BC before Christ passed. It is gone. It's just dead air. You go and play the tape. Somebody erased it. I don't want to point any fingers, but I think it was God. Amen? He said, I'm not interested in the past. I'm calling you to the future. There's a big difference between the future and the past. Hallelujah. I get excited about my own future. Man, that's a lot of Amen. You know, one good thing about the trials and troubles of the past is they're in the past. Amen? Amen. Leave them there. The Lord is not limited by your past. Walking with Jesus means you, you turn away from the past and you put the future in His hands. Amen? Amen. Isn't that awesome? Amen. Put the future in His hands. Yep. Future in His hands. Just like, you know, if you're going to Go for a ride. I'd rather have the future in the Lord's hands than put it in my hands. It's like putting it in a teenager's hands who just got their learner's permit. So let's go for a ride. Scary thing. Let me ask you another question. I'm asking questions this morning. What do you see as the biggest thing holding you back in life? Because people see things holding them back. Yeah. Maybe you look in the mirror. Maybe I would be willing to bet that the things that you see today is holding you back are things that you've dragged along from the past. You got heavy chains on it. It's like a cement block. And you're dragging this thing. Wouldn't it be easier to just let go of the cement block and the chain and go with Jesus? Amen? Amen. 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 Now, maybe you've tried some things in the past and it didn't work out. Well, let me tell you something. If you tried it without Jesus, that's a totally different thing. Maybe you're afraid to try again because of what you weren't successful in the past. But guess what? All things are possible with whom? God. With God. Amen. I can do all things through who? Through Christ who strengthens me. <clears throat> I know the Lord's talking to some people here this morning. Yeah. As a matter of fact, people come to me every now and then and say, how did you know? How did you talk to this stuff? I don't know anything, folks. I'm just like Forrest Gump. <laughs> My sermon is like a, a box of chocolates. I never know what I'm going to get, but God knows what you're going to get. Amen? Amen. Today we have an opportunity to step out with the Lord and not to go it alone. Everyone in here this morning should memorize a couple verses if you don't already know them. I think you already know them. But well, you know, knowing something and living something, something are two different things. Amen? Amen. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Great verses. I've preached on these lots and lots of times. I've done it in all places in the adult home ministries that we've done. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge him. It says, and he shall direct your paths. Yep. 
Now let me tell you something. Isn't it good to have God direct in your past? Yeah. Yes. Yep. Amen. Yep. He will never say, a little farther, a little farther, a little, oh, crash. Oh, that was too far. <laughs> That's not how God directs your path. Some of your friends might do that. I don't know. You see, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, there are three things. Three things that we have to do. Three. One, two, three. Amen? Amen. We do three, he'll do the fourth. And that's how it works. If you don't do, do the three, he's not going to do the fourth. It says, um, if we do those three things, who's directing your path? Well, Father, Son, or Holy Spirit, they're one. Amen? Amen. Amen. But let me tell you something about God. He knows everything. Mm -hmm. He knows all that can be known. He knows the past, the present, the future. And folks, He knows us better than we know ourselves. A lot Amen. better. Amen. Amen. Ask, ask your neighbor, does the Lord know you better than you know yourself? Go ahead. Absolutely. <laughs> the Lord, does the Lord know what you can and cannot do? Yeah. Yeah. Boy, why do we say when God tells us to do something? Lord, I can't do that. Didn't you know that, God, that I can't do that? And God says, I, oh, I must, I'm just learning it from you, right? No. He has all knowledge. There is never anything you can encounter walking with the Lord that He doesn't see coming. Now let me ask you something else. Think about this. We've all been in situations we looked at and said, that's too hard for me. That's too tough for me. Have you ever been in a situation you looked at and said, oh, that's too tough for the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-seeing creator of the universe? That's too powerful for him. That's too hard for him. No, it's not. There's nothing. There's a lot of things that are too hard for me. There's nothing too hard for God. Amen. When Moses was standing up against the edge of the Red Sea, and he had armies coming down on him. Oh, that's too hard for me. Of course it's too hard for you, Moses. But if you lift a stick up in the air and hold your hands up, the waters will part because it's not too hard for God. Yeah. Hallelujah. If God will part the Red Sea for Moses, why can't he take care of our petty little problems now and then, hey? Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. In His promise to us, God says basically if we trust in Him, if we do the three things, He'll do the fourth. What are the three things? Well, number one, trust in the Lord with all your heart. That's one. That's just one. Number two, turn and tell your neighbor, here's where you screw up all the time. You might have been watching your neighbor. It says, lean not on your own understanding. What does that mean? It means don't overthink it. Lean not on your own understanding. It says, in all your ways acknowledge Him. We're going to walk through these three. It says, then He will direct your paths. And when the Lord directs your path, guess what, folks? You're not in it by yourself, are you? He's directing you. You're not in it by yourself. Now, I know life doesn't seem fair, and it's not. We live in a world full of, of sin. And there are a lot of lost sinners out there in rebellion against God. People do whatever they want to do. Sometimes you hurt other people. But you know what? If you're living life by relying merely on yourself or even on other people and not God, you're living under a curse, according to my Bible. Your, your existence day by day is actually cursed. Well, I'm self-reliant. Like the guy that I won't point any fingers doesn't like to ask directions. <laughs> you don't get there very fast that way. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Jeremiah 17.5 says, this is what the Lord says. Cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans, who rely on human strength, and turn their hearts away from the Lord. Those who don't trust the Lord with all their heart. It's talking about. They are like stunning shrubs in the desert with no hope for the future. 
They will live in a barren wilderness in an uninhabited salty land. Salty land, yep. Yeah, another version talks about it. It's like tumbleweeds in the Old West. It's all dry. You see these tumbleweeds blow through. Those, think of those going through as Christians going through life. Who didn't trust in the Lord with all their heart, but leaned on their own understanding. Who didn't acknowledge God in all their ways. And there they go all alone through the desert. Every wind of trouble blowing them wherever it's going and they can't do anything about it. But when we set out to trust the Lord with all our heart and not to just lean on our own understanding, when we're willing to keep on walking by acknowledging the Lord in all of our ways. Now I'll give you a little hint about that. You know what it means to acknowledge the Lord in all your ways? Don't leave Him with the Bible under the seat in your pew when you go home from church. Take Him with you. Amen. Amen. He's there anyways, but take Him with you. Acknowledge Him in all your ways. It says in Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8, I can't give you the curses without the blessing. It says, But blessed are those who trust in the Lord, who have made their Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along the riverbank with roots that re reach down into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. Wow. You want to be productive? You want to be successful? You want to have everything fall apart around you and still keep on going? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And I'm going to show you how this works. And, uh, you know, we live, in a, we live in a different world today. Different generations. I have no trouble going from theory to application. But some people have a hard time. They, get, they hear the theory, but then they say, well, what do I do? What do I do with it? Well, I'm going to give you an example out of the Bible about three kind of strange dudes named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yeah, they were kind of strange. You see, they trusted in the Lord with all their heart. They didn't lean on their own understanding and in all their ways they acknowledged Him and God directed their paths. Imagine that. Let's, let's, let's read Daniel, and I got a lot of scripture, I know, but I'm going to go through it fairly quickly here. Daniel 2, 48, it says, Then the king appointed Daniel a high position and gave him many valuable gifts, and he made Daniel ruler over the whole province of Babylon, as well as ruler over all of his wise men. And at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be in charge of of all the affairs of the province of Babylon, while Daniel remained in the king's court. So Daniel was blessed at that time, and so were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know what they were doing? Why they got blessed? Because they were trusting in the Lord with all their heart. They weren't leaning on their own understanding. They acknowledged Him in all their ways. Amen? Amen. Nevertheless, Trouble may come, even if you're trusting in the Lord. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have trouble. Let's look at this story here. It says, King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then he sent messages to the high officers, officials, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the provincial officials to come to the declaration of the statue he had set up. He sent messages to everybody to come see his big old nasty statue, his idol that he built, made out of gold, 90 feet tall. So all these officials came and stood before the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald shouted out, people of all races, of races, nations, and languages, listen to the king's command. When you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipes, or any other musical instrument, bow to the ground to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. Whoa. Anyone who refuses will be immediately thrown into what? A blazing furnace. So at the sound of the musical instruments, all the people, folks, when they heard it, 
their understanding told them, when I hear the music play, I need to run and bow down to that statue, or else. It says, all the people, whatever were race, nation, or language, bowed to the ground and worshiped the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. But some of the astrologers went to the king and, and informed on the Jews, guess what, they squealed on them. They said, King Nebuchadnezzar, long live the king. <clears throat> you issued a decree requiring all the people to bow down and worship the gold statue when they hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipes, and any other musical instruments. That decree also states that, all, that those who refuse to obey must be thrown into a blazing furnace. So they restated the law to the king. Then they said, but there are some Jews. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who you have put in charge of the province of Babylon, they pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage and he ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him, and they were brought in. So guess what? King was angry, and he's bringing them in. They're being called on the carpet, and here they come before this king. Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or worship the gold statue I have set up? <clears throat> and I will give you one more chance. Listen to this. King says, I'll give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what? God will be able to rescue you from my power. Now, it's interesting the king gave him one more chance because somebody else he might not. He probably just throw him in the fire. But they were, they were blessed of God. They were given favor with, with God and with men. Because why? They trusted the Lord with all their heart. They didn't lean on their own understanding. In every one of their ways, they acknowledged God. Including not bowing down. Well, not only did they trust in the Lord, not only did they not lean on their own understanding, but they weren't shy about telling the king about it. And they replied, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we, are being, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, <laughs> I love this part of it. We want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you set up. Whoa. Gave them a second chance. And they said, we don't need a second chance. We don't need a third chance. You see, they were going to serve the Lord. So he says, Nebuchadnezzar was so furious. It says, we want to make it clear to your majesty, we'll never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you set up. Nebuchadnezzar was so furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face became distorted with rage. I can't even imagine what that must have looked like. Must have twisted all up and snarled. And good grief. He commanded the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. They probably had a big bellow blowing air into it and putting fuel in that furnace. He ordered some of the strongest men in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. It says, so they tied them up and threw them into the furnace, fully dressed in pants, turbans, robes, and other garments. It says, and because the king in his anger had demanded such a hot fire, in the furnace, the flames killed the soldiers as they threw the three men in. They got fried before they got fried just throwing them in. They didn't go in the furnace. 
The Bible wants to make it clear. The furnace was hot, folks. So Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego securely tied, fell into the roaring flames. And that's the end of the story. They're all burned up and it was a terrible thing, right? No. You see, they trusted in the Lord with all their hearts. They didn't lean on their own understanding. They didn't, when the king says, I'll give you another chance, say, you know what, I'm thinking about this now. i got a better idea. Let's go worship the statue. We'll go out to lunch later. No. What was their own understanding telling them? There's no way out of this. You're going to burn up in the furnace. That's their own understanding. But they didn't lean on that. As a matter of fact, when they stood before King Nebuchadnezzar, they acknowledged him in all their ways. They had trusted in the Lord by defying the king's order. They had not leaned on their own understanding by denying his, his second attempt to give them a time off if they would just bow down and worship the, the statue to let them out of the punishment. And, and, they acknowledged God in all their ways by standing before the king and says, we don't have to be careful. We serve the Lord, not your goofy idol. Amen. Folks, acknowledging God in all of your ways is going to make some people angry. That's right. It may give adverse birth to adverse circumstances in your life. But you know what? I'd rather see people get angry and have the Lord pleased. I'd rather have a few adverse circumstances and have God on my side or on me on his side than to try to find a compromise and wiggle the way out. Well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did all three steps without hesitation. And let me tell you about something. When they said to the king, the Lord's able to save us, but even if he doesn't, we're not going to worship your goofy statue king. We're not going to worship him. We serve the Lord. Their work was done. God requires no more of them. You know, they had trusted in the Lord with all their heart. They had not leaned on their own perception of the situation, their own understanding. They had acknowledged God in all their ways. They're done. They're finished. It's God's turn. They were bound. There was nothing more they could do. You ever been in a situation where you feel like your hands are tied? Their hands were tied. Their feet were tied. They had the strongest guys in the kingdom. They were bound up pretty tight. Well, God required no more of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now it's the Lord's turn. In our lives, and we've done all three, you can rest in this, that God will direct your path. You see, King Nebuchadnezzar thought he was putting Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego to death. He's, he, he wanted their destruction. But you know what? God had a different idea. Hallelujah. Think of where they were. They were, they were rulers in the kingdom. This was a great fall. They were going from a ruler to a crispy critter in the furnace, right? That's not good. Well, let's read on. It says, suddenly Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, didn't we tie up three men and throw them in the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did, they replied. Look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see how many? Four. Four men. Unbound. Walking around in the fire unharmed and the fourth looks like a god. You know, I know who that was, that fourth one. That was a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. That was him in the furnace with those three guys. Walking around right in the fire unharmed. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. Acknowledge Him in all your ways, and it says, and He shall direct your paths. Now there's something else we need to pick up here. The Lord just doesn't direct our paths. We think a direct is like this. Hey you, go on over there and do something. That's not what He did. 
The Lord wasn't sitting outside the furnace looking down saying, hey, you guys, why don't you climb on out of there? He was in the fire with them. Amen. And you know what? Even in the midst of the fire, he broke all of their bondages. They were free, folks. That's right. They were unbound. What an awesome, awesome thing. Hallelujah. When you're in a trial and in trouble, when you trust in the Lord with all your heart, when you stop leaning on your own thinker to figure things out, but trust in God, when you acknowledge Him in all your ways, you say, I don't care who knows I'm a Christian and I'm praying. I'm going to keep on praying because the Lord's able to deliver me. And even if He doesn't, I'm still going to be delivered because He's still God. Amen? Amen? What an awesome thing. And God isn't looking on from outside. He's in it with you. And let me tell you about something. When God is in it with you, there is no fire, no flame, no flood, no trial, no trouble that is going to destroy you because you cannot destroy God. No. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. Well, there's a word, Jehovah Shammah. And it means Jehovah is there. You know where he is? He's, he's here. He's present. God is present is another translation. He's present. Folks, we don't have to cry out for the Lord. We can speak softly and he hears every syllable of our words coming out of our mouth. Because when we trust in Him, when we don't lean on our own understanding, but we trust in Him and His Word, when we acknowledge Him, when we don't walk away from our Christianity because of the trial and look for a way out, guess what, folks? He's in the trial with you. That's right. Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace and shot it, which was probably quite a ways back because that was one hot furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God. Excuse me? What do you call them? Servants of the Most High God. You know, when he said, no God is able to save you, you know, your God will... That was a small G. This is the capital G. Yeah? Um, he had what's known as a come-to-Jesus moment there. So Shadrach... He said, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the fire. Then the high officers, officials, governors, and advisors crowded around them and saw that the fire had not touched them. It hadn't touched them. Amazing. It hadn't touched them. Not a hair on their head was singed. And their clothing was not scorched. Now listen to this. It did not even smell of smoke. Wow. How about that? I mean, you sit around a campfire, you know, at night, you have a sweatshirt on, you take it off, it's like, it smells like campfire, right? Yeah. This was more than a campfire, folks. This was a heavy duty fire. <coughs> What does that mean, that it didn't even smell like smoke? It means that when God is with you, folks, when you've trusted in the Lord, when you haven't just trusted in your own flesh and strength or your own thoughts and reasoning, when you've acknowledged Him in all your ways and He's in it with you, He protects you. He doesn't let anything get on you. It says here, Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He has sent his angel to rescue his servants who trusted in him. They defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Small g, capital G. Amen. You know, we look at the end result of that. What happened? Guess what? It happens two things when you acknowledge God in all your ways. God gets glorified. Amen? That's number one. God gets glorified. When you trust in the Lord with all your heart, when you lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge Him, God gets glorified. The whole kingdom in Babylon was glorifying a God that they gave no regard to before. Isn't that an awesome thing? But there's something else, folks. 
When God comes into your situation and walks with you and brings you through it, you get blessed. They were blessed before. They were blessed before. But they were more blessed afterwards. With the Lord, when you trust in Him, when you don't lean on your own understanding, when you acknowledge Him in your, all your ways, you go from blessing to blessing to blessing. It may be by means of a trial. You know, the fire of the flood. But God will see you through those things. Amen. Therefore, I make a decree, says this king, if any people, whatever their race or nation or language, speak a word against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be torn limb from limb. Their houses turn to heaps of rubble. There is no other God who can rescue like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to even higher positions in the providence of Babylon. So what's the bottom line here? Well, we don't live in Babylon. At least I hope America is not Babylon. But sometimes I wonder. But God's word is true. He's no respecter of persons. If it worked for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it'll work for you, amen? amen? It'll work for all of us. If we trust in the Lord with all our heart and don't lean on our own understanding, if we, if we learn to do that and then acknowledge Him in all your ways, He's going to direct your paths. What does that mean? It means if you're at work and you have a problem at work, you don't have to stand up on your desk and proclaim the God of Isaac or Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That they might think you've lost your mind. But maybe pray. Even if it's to yourself, say, Lord, how are we going to solve this? If you've got a situation and you can't tell which way to turn, God knows. Don't lean on your own understanding. Trust in Him. Acknowledge Him in all your ways. Let's all stand. <coughs> Let me give you a hypothetical situation now. What would happen if you did this on a daily basis? If you memorized the Scripture, if you taped it, to your refrigerator or whatever you're looking at a lot in the house, it might be my fridge, or on the bathroom mirror, and looked at it and said, I'm going to do these three things because I know God's going to do the fourth. He's going to do the right. All of my paths, every day, and no matter what trial I face, what trouble, I have the knowledge and assurance I'm not in it by myself. God's with it. And even the smell of smoke isn't going to get out of me. I don't care what kind of fire it is. Because the Lord is with me. If you want to start living that, we're going to have communion in just a minute. Matter of fact, I'd like you to just raise your hands up. Just raise your hands up and say, Father God, I believe your word. I believe your word. That if I trust in you, with all my heart, if I don't lean on my own understanding,